Well, I uh, do wish you a uh, happy new year. Uh, this is our first worship service of a, a new calendar year. And as you know, after the uh, typical things of a new year, watching the ball drop on New Year's Eve and uh, the Rose Parade, which I have fond memories of working as a, as a uh, young person uh, with millions of people, it seemed, uh, sleeping out overnight and looking forward to this uh, great parade in the uh, new year. Um, the, uh, a lot of funny things also happen in the new year. Uh, health clubs are packed and regular members, of course, skip a few days because they know all these new enthusiasts will be in there working out and uh, they secretly are appreciative of these folks. So they've got a gym membership as a Christmas gift or perhaps joined because of a New Year's resolution and they know in a couple, three weeks all of it will die down and their money will subsidize their membership for the rest of the year. Uh, they tell us that liquor sales drop. Uh, smokers stop smoking. Uh, Weight Watchers membership uh, balloons for a while. And uh, all sorts of other things uh, happen because folks make New Year's resolutions. Which uh, begs the question, why do we put ourselves through such rigor? Why do we uh, commit, but uh, statistically uh, we're told uh, only about one out of ten New Year's resolutions actually take hold and make a difference. Now as a Christian, is it a good thing to make a New Year's resolution? Is it a good thing to, to do th something? And I'll uh, at least propose for now, it, it is. And I think that's why we make promises to ourselves. Uh, despite sometimes not keeping them, perhaps often not keeping them, uh, we do make promises to ourselves, and uh, we try to strive for something a little bit more noble, a little better, something that will enrich us a little bit more. Uh, but I do think there are some smart ways to go about doing this as well. Uh, why do we, we make resolutions? Why are we inclined that way humanly? Uh, well, I believe it's because we all want to feel we're making some progress in life. I think it's because sometimes we feel the need for a fresh start, a new page, a new beginning. Uh, we want to kickstart some grand idea, we want to promote something that we are resolve is important to us. Now perhaps, since quite a few of us are seniors in this group, uh, we feel more settled. Uh, perhaps if you're a little younger, life tends to go a little bit more up and down. Um, on the other hand, I know for myself, I don't know how much older I get, uh, I fear that in some ways I will stagnate, that I will fail to reach certain potential that I know I have, so I tend to reflect and take some time to consider where life is going to take me. <clears throat> As I said, uh, even if you're really ancient and you want to admit to it, I think you still resolve in your own mind that certain pages need to be turned over in and uh, you wish for something a little different. Uh, on the other hand, some people are more goal-oriented. Uh, they're a little uh, less, say, in the moment, and they want to think in terms of two and three and five years. It's funny, many years ago, I, uh, I know we were going to a festival in Penticton, and I uh, uh, had my 16-year-old daughter at the time. She'd learned to drive, and uh, she was getting out of school at 4 o'clock. And uh, we were going to drive uh, after the rest of the family all the way to Penticton. We're going to drive through the night. And I said to her, well, this will be a great father-daughter bonding experience. And you get to drive all you want. And I get to snooze in the passenger seat at least some of the time. And I said, won't it be great? And she looked at me and she said, well, it will be as long as we don't have to talk about fun you know, sarcastic little minx, you know, but I was the sort of father who said, you know, wh what are you doing now in grade 11 and grade 12? Where's it going to take you five years from now? And pretty quickly she got fed up with hearing that and let me know. Uh, on the other hand, then she uh, in later life became a mother and it became a case of, girls, have you thought about the next five years? And uh, it is true, they say, you know, we eventually turn into our parents. But Many years ago, I had a friend in ministry uh, by the name of Dan, 
Some of you uh, may have met him once, Dan Bannum, an Australian, and he was a, uh, a, a fun guy. But he introduced me to an idea because he uh, had challenged his congregation to uh, individually, and there were a lot of young people, you know, 40 years ago in that congregation, uh, that they their personal five-year plan. And uh, he said he felt that uh, quite a few people benefited from that. So I tried it as well. This was the uh, early mid-70s when I pastoring in a lot of young families. And it uh, was surprising how many people came back to me a couple, three years after. And I continued to use that as a pattern. Uh, I got uh, gifts, notes, cards. Uh, a couple of people sent me books that they had written and gotten published. And they signed inside the uh, leaf, thank you for inspiring me to act on something that I really wanted to accomplish. Uh, a couple of people gave me uh, uh, portraits, not of me, but, you know, landscapes or something like that, that they had painted. This is a result of me starting art classes. Had a, a vision, and this uh, they felt really helped kickstart their life because I challenged them, make it a five-year plan, and then break it down to a one-year plan, and do those things. Now that's not exactly going to excite you as a senior. Maybe your plan is to uh, to uh, make it to next New Year's. Maybe your plan is to stretch the pension a little bit better this year, but that's about it. And so I'm not uh, in any way implying that if you don't have a five-year plan, uh, that uh, in some ways you're failing God. But I know that having started a new phase in my personal life, uh, I had to sit down and go through that exercise because now I'm responsible and uh, in, a, in a relationship that requires me to consider the impact of my life on somebody else. And so, uh, you know, we've done a number of things, uh, in, including uh, painting, rearranging, having to dump certain things that are old, buy some new furniture. Uh, it's easy to buy it, you know, but you've got to have a one or two year plan to pay for it, things like that. And so it's been somewhat important for me. Insurance has to change. Uh, can, all sorts of considerations have to change in a, a new relationship. Uh, but whatever you might settle as legitimate reasons for making resolutions, uh, perhaps you've read and wondered what James has to say on this particular subject. Uh, if you take a look at James chapter 4 and verse 13, uh, and I have it uh, on the uh, slide there, he says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city and spend a few years there. We'll carry on business and make money. Why do you not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that uh, appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and you brag. All such boasting is evil. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Hey, what is James saying? I'm going to propose that James is not against planning, not against achievement. But he is against assuming that life will always work out the way you plan, which is kind of arrogant considering that God is God and you're not. It's kind of arrogant when you have to realize that you're not exactly the master of your own ship, that God is sovereign and it is his providence that we have to rely on. So that's a very important point. It's also a notion that success equals achieving your material goals. You know, as I mentioned a moment ago, I had to consider everything from life insurance to investment in new this and that and the other thing and over there. But that is not ultimate success by any means. It's stuff you might have to do and have to manage responsibly. But it is not success. Success is sometimes just standing, sometimes just overcoming. Uh, we sang about that a few moments ago. Not going start raving bonkers in difficult circumstances. That could be success. Success is, we are told, being of good cheer. In the words of Jesus, I have overcome the world. Now, the concept of overcoming, maybe I will digress for a few moments because this is a very important point to realize. And I grew up with the idea that overcomers, he that overcomes, shall inherit the kingdom. 
And the idea was to set goals, to overcome your weaknesses, your problems, your failings, your quirks, things like that. But when Jesus said, be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, uh, the first thing I know about the world is it didn't go away. Uh, the world didn't stop. When Jesus said, I've overcome the world, you might rephrase it and say, well, he did not succumb to the world. He, quote, overcame him, if you think about it. The world succeeded in killing him. But he claimed he overcame. And this is a huge point for Christians. Um, you are already a child of God. You are loved. You are, if you will, fussed over. You are precious. You are accepted. You are, in God's mind, born to win. Not born to see if you can succeed in overcoming and qualify to be my child. You are already his child. You will never overcome, in quotes, enough. You will never succeed enough. You will never stand tall enough. You will never conquer your weaknesses, your frailties, your problems to qualify smart enough to be a child of God. You are already a child of God. Uh, you're responsible to grow in grace and knowledge. But you cannot start from the idea that if I just overcome uh, to take a scripture completely out of context, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Well, if you're talking about surviving the siege of Jerusalem, and you're talking about physical salvation, well, then you begin to understand. But if you think that by enduring and struggling to the end of something, by planning and setting objectives and succeeding, then you might actually find your way into God's grace and favor, then you completely have the wrong idea. You came in the front door today. I came in the back door, so it wasn't there. But if you came in the front door today, you'll see some uh, wag many years ago when they poured that concrete step, put some words in the front step uh, as you step into this church building. Do any of you notice the words? You don't have to tell me what they are, but you know what they are? Blank faces. Oh, I didn't look down and see it. The words are, notice them when you leave. Smile, God loves you. <laughs> Okay? Smile, God loves you. You're stepping into church where you come to be reminded that God already loves you. Not, have you done enough of this? Have you achieved enough to qualify for his love? He already loves you. He's already given his life for you. So, let me get that sort of as a foundation block for your approach to... Because I still, as I said, believe that resolve and planning is important. And that's why I wanted to tackle the theme of New Year's resolutions, because here we are with a new year. Um, there's a French surgeon by the name of Nelaton who said that if he had four minutes to perform life-dependent surgery, he would take the first minute to plan. The first minute to plan. Preparation is the key for success in life, knowing where you want to go. And as the old cliche is, if you don't know where you're going, you probably won't get there. But if you begin with an idea of what you want to see happen, there's a good chance. We were taught in the very beginning uh, of uh, speech class. And I remember this as a 17, 18-year-old kid in the little textbook by Dale Carnegie. And the one quotable quote I remember from that textbook was, A speech well prepared is nine-tenths delivered. And if you've done your preparation, you don't have to collapse in nerves. You know, uh, every sermon that I give, actually, I stand behind Walt Schmidt's work. I don't know if you realize that. But this podium, I don't know how many decades ago Walt built it, but I know uh, we have one in Westlock I stand behind every Sunday. I know that Walter has uh, modified this over the years. He put a turbo in, so it goes up and down. And uh, he uh, sort of re did the, the bass, and he does things with this, uh, but he, always, he, he stained it my favorite color, burgundy, and uh, I don't know if he read my mind or whatever, but uh, as, as a craftsman, the first thing he does is get his famous clipboard out and his pencil, and he builds it on paper. He outlines it, 
Every bit and piece, I think, uh, is first of all planned before he touches the saw and before he touches the wood. And the planning, probably, in the execution of this, along with the skill of being able to do it right, which I can't do, I mean, you know, as long as I can do it with a, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a skill saw or something like that, maybe I could get something done. But, uh, you know, the, the, before this took shape, it was a picture in a mind, and it was a picture on paper, and there was resolve. And as I said, every week, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Saturday or Sunday, I stand behind Walter's work, which is a say because I stand behind his thoughts. But anyway, every sermon I give. But it started on paper. It started on paper. And it, before it got to paper, it started in the mind. You know, that's the way it works. And as James chapter 1 and verse 4 says, God requires us to plan and to have some end in mind. He put it this way, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The idea of having an, uh, an idea of what you're pressing towards. Your plans <clears throat> do reveal a lot about your relationship with God. Uh, some people feel their relationship can be spontaneous, you know, one day a week, uh, and their resolve is. Um, on the other hand, when it sinks into your heart, the other six days of the week come into play. In other words, it, reve our, 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 it reveals our thoughts and our planning. What are we pushing towards day in and day out? The, see, the merchant in James 4 assumes he can plan unconditionally. He can plan next year's itinerary. He can act arrogantly because he's control of his future. On the other hand, as a Christian, we understand God's providence or sovereignty. There's no such thing as sort of God allowing just stuff for no good reason. I was uh, trying to illustrate this. I, I ran across the story of a cowboy who applied for health insurance. And he was a good Texan, and uh, he went and he said, uh, the agent asked, have you had any accidents in the last year? And the cowboy replied, he said, uh, no, I've not had any accidents, uh, but uh, I got bit by a rattlesnake. And a horse kicked me in the ribs, and I was laid up for a while. And the agent said, well, weren't those accidents? And the cowboy replied, no, they did it on purpose. <laughs> You see, uh, there's a certain understanding that when stuff happens, it, it, it may, in our parlance, be an accident. It may be as a result of something we didn't anticipate and somebody else acting in their free will and being foolish, sloppy, or deliberately vindictive or something, and something happens. But a Christian recognizing God's and has the sort of the same attitude as the cowboy. There may be stuff happening. You know, when Joseph was uh, <clears throat> sold by his brothers into slavery, uh, to him it was a very discouraging thing at the time, and it was a horrible setback. <clears throat> but when he finally talked about it with his brothers, and his brothers began to try to apologize, he answered with these words. <clears throat> he said, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. You sold me into slavery, and I could get really angry about that right now, but I recognize the sovereignty of God in all this, and he permitted this. I am in charge of food distribution in Egypt, and you and Dad and my, bro uh, my, uh, my little brother uh, Benjamin and all sorts of others are going to find life because of your decision that at the time set me back. So we take this particular view. <clears throat> we see, let's say, in the crucifixion, an adversary, Satan, who believes that he has achieved something. But from God's perspective in the crucifixion, uh, we see the redemption of all of humanity. Uh, another illustration I thought uh, spoke to this it was uh, actually a real man, a guy by the name of the Reverend Lay Lanham. 
and he had a tree fall on his garage, and it's reported that his neighbor said to him, isn't it wrong that a man of God should suffer from such an act of God? And uh, Ray answered this, I wouldn't know. I'm in sales, not management. Okay. That's a different respect. Now, I confess I can't take that attitude unless I really, really, really work hard at it. But for him to have that spontaneous response was rather interesting and perhaps speaks to a depth that I don't have. But as you look forward and you, you begin to see uh, perhaps and envision certain things, the guiding principle as a Christian uh, should be towards eternity. It really should. You know, Alexander the Great apparently had a great discussion with Diogenes, and uh, he asked, uh, they were going back and forth as to what they would wish for and hope for and ask for. And uh, Diogenes, the philosopher, uh, he said he would ask for the least portion of immortality if Alexander would give it to him. And Alexander said, that is not in my gift. I can't give you that stupid thing. And Diogenes replied, yeah, that's right. He said, why then does Alexander take such pains to conquer the world when he cannot assume, assure himself of one moment to enjoy it? Why are you setting this lofty goal of conquering the world when you can't ensure yourself tomorrow to enjoy it? Now, Paul speaks to this in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 when he puts it simply this. If you then be raised with Christ, he said, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Now that's a powerful balancing thought. I've been proposing and I even admitted that I sat down and thought, you know, what physical things am I responsible for this year? Okay, what am I supposed to be responsible for to other people? Uh, to my partner, to my kids, to others who look at me, depend on me, lean on me, things like that. What am I responsible for? For myself. Well, how can I balance this and remember that the first priority is that which is above? Hey, bit of a challenge bit of a task. Uh, to this end, a, uh, another illustration that it, I ran across, which I thought was very helpful, and it uh, came from uh, the story of an anonymous tourist who visited a 19th century Polish rabbi by the name of Hofetz Chaim. And he visited this rabbi's home, and we were astonished to see a simple room filled with books and a table and a bench. And the, he asked him, Rabbi, where is your furniture? And he says, well, where is yours? And the tourist said, mine? I'm a visitor here. I'm only passing through. Uh, to which the rabbi replied, so am I. So am I. Life is short. So don't focus, I committed, I admitted a while ago, uh, I've been a come a Costco kid, you know. Uh, you know, buy furniture, stuff to put my feet on, stuff to put my rear end on, stuff to sit next to my partner uh, on, you know. Uh, certain things are responsible, but hey, don't, you know, get yourself too wrapped up in this. Uh, on the one hand, you have to buy, on the other hand, you have to plan, you know, how are you going to do this over the next few years? On the other hand, don't get too emotionally wrapped up in this. And so you have to balance. And that's what James is going for. Don't be arrogant. Don't be thinking that you can give yourself eternity. Uh, as a businessman, don't think that you can just run the market and it's just going to keep going on and on and on. Because it's not. We all know in our hearts that there's going to be, quote, a massive pullback in a few years' time. Maybe next year, maybe the year after. But... You'd be foolish not to understand that. James is also reminding his readers then that life is complex and it's unpredictable. And he says simply, you know not what shall be on the morrow. 
okay? And he's saying, you know, you, you think you can buy, you can sell, you can get gain. Uh, he says, look, uh, you really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So, okay, make your plans, okay? But uh, I think Proverbs 27 and verse 1 puts it perfectly. It says, boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you know not what the day may bring forth. So life is also complex, and you have to understand that you just cannot uh, just make plans and, and, and predict that these things are going to happen. It's like uh, the story, you remember Charlie Brown and Lucy uh, and Linus, <clears throat> and uh, Charlie Schultz put it in the comic strip, uh, where Lucy says, life is like a deck chair. Some place it so that you can see where you're going. Some place it's so that you can see where you've been. And some place it so that you can see where you are at present. And Charlie Brown's reply is, I can't even get mine unfolded, you know. <laughs> Okay, so you try to unfold the deck chair. Some people make the mistake of focusing on the past. Eh, big mistake. Some people make the mistake of just living in the future. All right. Some people make mistake of just living essentially in the moment. Okay. And then Charlie Brown says, well, I can't even get the thing unfolded. Well... <clears throat> Between all this, we struggle for balance. And in making a godly view of our lives, it's important to realize then these lessons. Life is short. Life is complex and unpredictable. And life is unpredictable. But having said all that, let me go back to the idea that I lean upon, and that is it's a good thing to resolve and plan. So let's, in a very simple terms, take a look at a couple of points. Look, I think if you're going to make any predictions, any prognostications, any thoughts for the future, I hope you'd agree with me that you should pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. That's the one thing in the book of James that's given without limit, without restriction. Uh, you know, we'd all love to be able to pray, well, would you just sort of turn on the spigot and send down more money? No. Uh, would you just sort of my family is more in harmony and unity? No, you work at that, buddy. All sorts of things. But, but wisdom? Yeah. I will give you insight and wisdom because that is going to mature you and grow you through this experience. I hope you'd agree that you need to be realistic in light of the few things we've talked about. Hey, life is short. Don't be making any 20-year plans here, Bob, that I'll get this paid off in 20 years. Yeah, you can't guarantee 20 minutes, all right? The streets are pretty slick right now. You could go out here and rear-end a bus. A ridiculous thought, I know. <laughs> That's just an inside joke, okay? Some things you never live down, do you, Jim? All right? So you have to be realistic and realize can dream and think, and uh, you know, we're talking right now. In the first year, I think, of the Obama presidency, the market went up something like 25 percent. Whoa! First year of the Trump presidency, the market's gone up 20 percent. Wow! Yeah, everything goes up, you know, but what goes up kind of pulls back and adjusts. You really think you're going to have a million five years from now? Think again, buddy. Think again. Uh, you're, well, you're either going to have to rob a bank or uh, the stars are going to have to fall on you or you're going to have to buy a really, really big horseshoe because you just can't predict and plan that far ahead and you just aren't that smart. So be realistic. And it helps to write down your intentions, to write down your realistic intentions. Once you write them down, it's surprising. Boy, that looks silly now that I look at it. All right, okay, that's what it's going to be. You know, and some people are a lot better at this than others. You know, I was just talking to Mark about, uh, you know, the next couple of months and speaking responsibilities and other things. So he pulls out his day timer, or uh, I should say he pulls out his electronic calendar, 
And he looks at it and he beeps, yeah, I can do that. Why? Because I already planned something else in this particular point, and I know there are no conflicts. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not that sophisticated, but I try to write certain things down. And I have certain things, actually, I put it on an Excel spreadsheet to figure out. Look, I'm responsible, and I better not, you know, if, if something happens, will I leave chaos behind? Uh, will I lead disruption and hurt and pain and agony? Uh, which is why, uh, at least uh, when I was single especially, if I, if I left Edmonton, which is safe, secure, and you never have an accident in Edmonton, right? Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I would always talk to Carol Houghton, who was our church secretary, but uh, she had signing authority on everything I had signing authority on, including my personal bank account, and I said, if anything happens to me, if the plane goes down or anything like that happens, please remember uh, where all the dumb things are. And, uh, you know, I'd catch up the paperwork and I'd give it to her in a little plastic box and say, look, I don't want to leave chaos behind me. It's enough of a problem that I leave in chaos to you. <clears throat> and so there's a certain responsibility to that. Write down your intentions. And then you have to pray for the power to stay the course. Uh, because just as you have to pray for the wisdom to make the right choices, you also have to pray for the encouragement and the strength to press towards the things that you feel you need to accomplish. And a lot of these things, I realize I'm taking out of James, and these things are sort of financial, practical, things like that. But this covers the gamut of human endeavor, relationships that I need to work on and repair, uh, kindnesses that I feel personally I owe to other people. Um, all sorts of responsibilities that whirl around. And so if I write things down, resolve to do certain things, it sort of focuses me on uh, the breadth of my life and the realistic responsibilities that I'm facing. I hope as well you'd agree that you need to review your resolutions regularly. That is to say, if you just dingle away on an Excel spreadsheet like I might, and then a year from now I look at it, oh, well, Maybe I actually accomplished something because I wrote it down and focused on it. But every now and then I have to pull it up, and so it's sort of like this little thing on my desktop, and uh, I see it on a regular basis that says, hey, buddy, remind yourself that you said in January that by March or April you wanted to make sure this was working out, and you need to res review it. Uh, that tends to happen organically and naturally. Uh, especially as you get older and you realize that kids have birthdays, grandkids have birthdays, uh, that uh, if your partner is still with you and alive, uh, let's say you have thoughts and ideas, uh, that can include absolutely everything from time for a vacation to time to paint the house, you know, whatever it is that you're looking at. And especially, uh, I know today I'm going to go to Red Deer and speak, but uh, my, my wife will go home and uh, has a small group. And uh, they meet on a regular basis, and they go through a curriculum, and they have ideas that they want to see and achieve together on a regular basis. At least I hope they do. If they're just going for lunch, then I'm missing an important occasion. But uh, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying. I, I, I just know there were a pile of all sorts of goodies on the counter, and it was kind of one of those don't you dare touch, they're for important. Uh, okay, all right. So there are important people coming to my house this afternoon. I will not be there to supervise, but I know they'll have a good time. <clears throat> and so uh, you have to review on an occasion. And also, you're always going to have setbacks. You're always going to have deadlines that you don't meet. So run at it again tomorrow. You know, uh, just take care of today, uh, what, that little tiny step that takes you towards where you want to go, and it will be a tiny step that will take you towards what you want to go to, if you know where you want to go. That's the whole point. When you make resolutions, you have to be able to say to yourself, I know where I'm going, and with God's help, I will move towards it, and maybe even get there where you want to go you probably won't get there anyway. So that's why I propose it's a good thing, in a way, to have New Year's resolutions. And especially I find, you know, this is a 
a man-made thing, you know, January the 1st. But I will say this, uh, at uh, Easter, when I uh, experience uh, the thoughts of what Jesus has done for me, I find that a very meaningful time of the year. And I tend to reorient myself a little bit more at that occasion of the year. And the spring brings new life, renewal, uh, the thoughts especially. So that is a natural time when I would review things. Uh, perhaps summer break, uh, a natural time when I review things. And so whenever it, however it is, it falls for you. Maybe it's your birthday. As you as the old saying goes, another day older and deeper in debt, you know, <laughs> saying, Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I still got a whole bunch of things to accomplish here. Uh, you know, whatever the song is that speaks to you, however it is that it occurs to you. As you consider these things, <clears throat> you probably realize that there's a huge crossover between the mundane things of this life and what we would term spiritual maturity, spiritual growth. And how do we grow spiritually? Well, my thesis is the same. We look at these things, we plan, we take an inventory. We say, wow, the next time I see my grandkids, I don't want to be this way. The next time we have a confrontation in this relationship or that relationship, I want to handle it differently. I resolve to be more Christ-like. Dr. Dukacic's commentary today, as he said, you, these little things in life that you focus on, you recognize, and then you resolve to be more Christ-like in the next circumstance. What went wrong with this? What went wrong with that? Okay, I resolve that I will be more Christ-like in those things. So it is, as we take both, if you want to call it a physical inventory, a spiritual inventory, uh, a review that causes us to resolve to do something, it is a matter of really the way in which we make a commitment to a long, stable obedience in a very specific direction. And that direction is coming from above. It is in the person of Jesus Christ who is in the shape and the manner of godliness that we want to achieve, that we want to move towards. I, uh, I got a nice little video here a couple of days ago. And I'm very hopeful that uh, we can see it come up. It's uh, just a, uh, a little uh, web video, and uh, it's uh, a link that's on my PowerPoint. And I'm hoping Larry will give me a thumbs up and say it'll work. Thank you, Larry. Okay, let's just uh, share this for a moment as a thought. Yeah. 
night and days of falling sun. Well, a little bit of England there. Fireworks of the House of Parliament. A little bit of Canada there. Snow and polar bears. <laughs> but uh, we're uh, blessed to live in a uh, pretty wonderful nation. And we're blessed to have some very good times. You know, I was, spent a little time this last week talking to a Turkish immigrant who was a Muslim. And talking about the Middle East, the story of Esau and Jacob. And, and he was telling me in his words, and uh, from his little understanding of the uh, Quran, how strife continues, how misery continues, how grateful he is to live in Edmonton of all places. He lived, tried living in Vancouver, couldn't afford it, moved to Edmonton. But he said, you know, the leadership in the Middle East didn't care who he is, whether it's in Turkey or Syria. He said, the leaders, they said, the, he said, keep us in terror. And they use terror constantly to keep us vulnerable and to make sure that we don't really ask for real change or for a say in our lives, or for the freedom to live as we want to live. This is funny, you know, I, uh, I moved from England, which is uh, pretty, pretty nice. I said, years in California, which was really nice. But I figured Canada has been absolutely wonderful to me. All the good things in my life that have happened have happened here. That God has been able to bless me. And he said, yeah, you know, and uh, he didn't say it exactly, but he said, well, Allah is able to bless me here. And uh, we had a long and interesting discussion as he was uh, stopped in the middle of what he was doing. But I really feel blessed to be uh, Canadian. And uh, despite uh, the fact that we're uh, coming out of a bitter cold snap, I really resolve to uh, live my Christian life uh, to its fullest potential in this coming calendar year of 2018. To become more Christ-like and to become more responsible to, these, to the others who are uh, showing me love and appreciation and respect. And by the way, includes you, even you. So I hope for you, uh, even though we're four or five days into it, that uh, 2018 will be a spiritually enriching year and that your walk with Jesus Christ, our Savior, will be rewarding and illuminating and strengthening. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven today, as we consider a new calendar year, as we think about the ways in which we resolve to become more like your son, Jesus Christ, as we ask for your blessing on all of the details of our short, complicated, unpredictable lives, we do so in the confidence that we live in your love and in your grace and in your deep-seated desire to affirm in us that we are all winners in you and in through Jesus Christ, our Savior. I hope resources you've given us, the time, the energy, the health, the strength, the finances, the homes, the families, the relationships that you've given us, all of these good things, and use them to your glory as we move towards your kingdom in its fullness, and also to encourage others who might see our lives to move in the same direction as well. We thank you for all of your blessings, and we thank you for the opportunity to share them with each other today. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. <laughs>